If you are just coming in, um, I just want to welcome you to uh, Book Sandwiched In from the New Haven Public Library, New Haven Free Public Library. My name is Isaac Shub. I'm here with Professor DeSales Harrison, and we were just catching up after a few five years. Um, uh, Professor Harrison was taught uh, me uh, English in college, so full disclosure, um, I got to sit in his in his wonderful lectures, um, and we're really honored you you've come here. Um, you you teach poetry and creative writing at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Um, you got your BA uh, from Yale in 1990, as you were just saying, so back in New Haven, uh, virtually. Um, and you got your MA from Johns Hopkins and your PhD from Harvard. Um, and much of your teaching focuses on lyric poetry. You also published a book titled The End of the Mind, The Edge of the Intelligible in Hardy, Stevens, Larkin, Plath, and Gluck. And your debut novel, which you're here to talk about today, is called The Waters in the Wild. Um, so I think you're gonna talk about your book and read, I think, the prologue from your book. And before you do that, I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, what led you to study the areas that you did in college and graduate school? Um, did that come out of passion? You know, Can you tell us a little bit about that and what your academic work focuses on? Yes, for sure. Thank you, Isaac. And thanks also to the New Haven Public Library, of course. I'm grateful for the for the invitation and the, the opportunity to visit, talk about my book. Uh, the, the path I took was in some way foreordained according to family members who report that I declared when I was maybe seven or eight that I was going to be an English professor and why they didn't just shoot me then I don't I don't know um, it seems not only that I had a plan but that I was insufferable about it uh, that came to pass so here you know here I am in in my 50s doing just that and so in that sense my path was quite linear it was when I was an undergraduate in, in New Haven it was already something that was quite clear to me as as uh, a life I wanted to live, um, but the that linear plot is quite deceiving um, because it it masks uh, unbelievably, at least to me, a kind of unbelievably neck snapping, circuitous um, series of divigations and and deviations throughout. Um, and a, one of them in particular was, was relevant to this novel. I guess two of them are relevant to the novel. One is the, it's just the desire, um, an experimental uh, impulse to, to write novels, you know, not just to write criticism, not just to think about lyric poetry, which is my specialty and my field and my love but also to to write fiction i think that it that just has something to do with an intuition about how how my brain works or is intelligible to itself um, there's something just about storytelling and, and longer plot structures that makes a kind of sense to me and appeals to me in a way that shorter lyric uh, form as my professional bailiwick just doesn't seem quite so native to my to my being so there's always been this pull back and back and forth uh, lots of people have lots of pulls that doesn't in any way make my experience unique a more anomalous uh, and I think in some way unusual uh, period for me was a period in my in my late 20s and early 30s, where I had a kind of conversion experience and really not only believed, but but pursued the belief that that I had been wrong about the whole English professor plan and that what I wanted to become and ought to become was a psychoanalyst. Um, and, and so I undertook to do that as other external circumstances in life colluded so that I was in New York City, where one is one of the few cities in the world where one can train to be a psychoanalyst, where that profession is not thought of as a kind of antiquity or extinct creature. So that that seemed possible. Um, and like something that I, I ought to be doing. And so for four years, I was training um, while 
completing my degree and also sort of trying to maintain momentum on my, my academic career. Uh, but I was training to become a psychoanalyst thinking that at some point, the fullness of time, I would just dismount from the earlier plan, saddle up on the other plan and somehow, you know, magically transfer myself into a, a professional life as a practice, practicing clinician. That obviously didn't happen. Uh, the reasons for that not happening were also external in the sense that I, you know, really basic mundane banal considerations, like I had children, I needed health insurance, and the the life of a psychoanal psychoanalyst is often so precarious that the the spectacular precarity of the academic profession looks mighty safe and secure by comparison. So at that point in my life, it seemed that the only way that I could responsibly proceed would be to go back to plan A. What that left me with was four years of, of absolutely intense, engaging, transformative, fascinated, uh, bewildered encounter with not only the history of psychoanalysis, but also current theory and, and practice, um, which I think was probably one of the most astounding and influential intellectual experiences that I have had in my life. Um, and when I went back to academics and went back on the job market and eventually got a job teaching what I was trained to teach, which is lyric poetry or the lyric tradition in, in Anglophone literature, there was this big remainder, this big leftover quantity in my in my life that I thought about constantly and read about and influenced other things that I was writing on critically, but that I didn't feel that I could integrate or come to terms with until I started writing a novel um, about a psychoanalyst or with a psychoanalyst kind of at the, at the center of it. And so that was how I think I tried to wrangle that chapter of my life back into the, the center stage of my own um, of my own work as a as a writer. Um, and and what followed after a period of great, you know, torment and anguish and um, in just kind of not really fully accepting the fact that I was actually doing that thing. I was, you know, writing a novel and hoping to get it published. Um, after a lot of flopping around having to do with that, it did seem that a book had come into, had coalesced, um, and I could start sending it off to, to agents and ultimately publishers, and here we are. Uh, but it was a weird, I mean, it, it, struck, it strikes me even now as a kind of weird path, not necessarily one that I would recommend. Um, although I do think that I, I maintain a certain kind of evangelical fervor for um, the, the really unassimilably radical alien worldview that psychoanalysis um, still challenges our current, you know, late capitalist experiences with. Um, and so, so I was glad that I could kind of go, you know, back into that that world and think about it again from a different a different context. So that's the maybe not short enough version of that story. That's the short answer. Thank you. Um, so I have um, I have your book here, which uh, we have at the library, The Waters in the Wild. Um, and I mean, the, you know, I have to say that the cover is a little deceptive because it looks uh, looks very placid. But I mean, this is a kind of a, a suspenseful thriller with a very tightly wound plot or very finely tuned plot that is also um, manages to have a lot of reflective passages and this, these themes of psychoanalysis and, and all kinds of things. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, I'd love to hear, uh, do you wanna read a little bit from the book? Sure, yeah, if that's, um, if that's good. I thought I would read for just about the, the first prologue and we'll see where that leaves us in terms of or the only prologue, but the first chapter of the book and we'll see where that leaves us in terms of time. Uh, it just sets up the original encounter that, that starts the story off. It's not between, uh, it's between a young woman and a priest uh, who's not a psychoanalyst and is in some sense the, the, the opposite, at least as he understands his own relationship to, 
big questions such as responsibility or forgiveness or, or memory. Uh, he thinks of himself as being largely separate from those, those pressing questions. But the plot begins when, you know, like those old Reese's peanut butter cup commercials where somebody gets his chocolate in, in someone else's peanut butter and they discover that there's an unusual combination here. For me, the story began when, when the combination of a kind of older framework for responsibility, guilt, uh, redemption, et cetera, meets a newer framework that is, that is the framework provided by a more therapeutic understanding of the human person. So the prologue is called the prologue and it has a date. The date is October, 2008. Had you a night scope or the eye of a night bird staring down from the rafters of the church, you could make him out the priest, supine, sunk in darkness, wide awake. He had not seen her come in, the girl. How long ago had that been, Father Spurlock wondered, lying on the shelter cot, his gaze lost above him in the groined and vaulting darkness, the groined and vaulting shadows of the church. Three weeks, he counted, three weeks since she appeared, occupying the cafe table as though she had always been there, her profile still engraved as a figure cut in bas relief. The table she had chosen in the church cafe was the small one beneath the Noah window, and the stained glass eye of Noah's crow scrutinized her, or rather the sheet of paper she'd unfolded in front of her, as though the crow had perched on the gunwale of the ark for that purpose alone. That day she had approached him, shown him the paper, and abruptly departed, leaving him with nothing save the name Clementine Abend scrawled on the palm of his hand. How long had she been sitting there, staring out at the evening rush hour traffic, or rather through the traffic, as though, as, as though one might stare through a clear stream to its stream bed? bed. Had she been there when he tied on his apron over his clericals and assumed the 5 p.m. shift behind the cafe counter? And at what moment had she changed, imperceptibly and without moving, from anyone into someone, from someone into that girl? But no, she wasn't a girl anymore. Even from where he stood, he could sense that. 18? Possible that she seemed older. 20? No, younger than that. Something in her bearing, in the unmoved abstraction of her gaze, had convinced him that she expected no one, that no one would arrive to join her. The volume of huge darkness pressed down on his chest like a book of stone. Yes, he remembered, she had chosen the table under the Noah window, the crow over her shoulder hunched up and pitch black against the glassy expanse of the floodwaters. If the crow had been visible when she had come in, he thought, if the rest of the window had yet to go dark, then she had arrived just before sunset. She had remained into the evening, even after Luis, the custodian, had stacked the last chairs and herded the tables together, chaining everything to an eye bolt he'd sung in the, sunk in the church facade. Buenas noches, padre, Luis had said, as he always said, closing the doors on the setting sun as he left. Que duerma bien. Then the girl had been alone in the closed shop. It was Father Spurlock's custom, since the cafe had first opened eight months ago in what had once been the Lady Chapel, to intone a mock dismissal, filling the space with his ringing ecclesial baritone. Hallowed grounds is closing now. Go in peace. We're here every day, even Sundays, before adding with hambone emphasis especially on Sundays. Now, however, he didn't know what to say. She couldn't, she wasn't hoping to stay in the church, was she? The overnight visitors, as they were known with varying degrees of irony by the vestry, knew to approach the church after dark, to stash their carts behind the alley dumpsters before making their way through the service door. Surely she was not one of them. Even if there was something vagabond about her, she'd propped up a worn backpack in the seat facing her, 
her bearing shared nothing with the unreachable, untouchable abjection of the visitors. Untying his apron, he had resolved then to revert to his pastoral approach and greet her as he would greet any tourist or passerby from the avenue. Welcome to the incarnation, miss, he would say. I'm Father Spurlock. What brings you here today? He regretted now, as he never did otherwise, that he had let his beard, heavy and lion gold, grow long enough to hide his priest's collar. Three weeks later, staring up from his cot into the dimensionless darkness of the church, he saw it again as though she had never left, her profile against the wall beneath the Noah window. The custodian man, she had said, had told her to wait until the coffee shop had closed. Padre Spurlock, Luis had said, would be, able, would be able to see her then. So, Father Spurlock thought, I have Luis to thank for this as well. We've got Luis to thank for this, Mrs. Nickerson, his helmet-haired secretary, never tired of proclaiming, whether in amazement or gratitude or exasperation. Luis, whom the church payroll listed as Sexton, Luis, who referred to himself, even after 40 years and six rectors, as the janitor. With inert forbearance, Luis had taken the coffee, coffee house project in stride. How many outreach initiatives, Spurlock wondered, had Luis watched flower and die? How many hours, days, years had he spent clearing the debris of all volunteer projects, the pageants, the potlucks and rock operas, the water table set up along the avenue for Marathon Sunday, the much advertised yearly blessing of the animals with its attendant panoply of shit shapes to be hustled into his dustpan. Luis responded to each new request with an undeceived and unobliging, if that's how you want it, Padre. But hadn't Luis, unasked, taken to hauling chairs and tables from the sidewalk every evening? He had Luis to thank for that, for the vigilant eye bolt, for the sidewalk hosed clean each night of sugar wrappers, lemon rinds, and coffee stirrers, for the doors opened every morning, the coffee made, and the pastries laid out for the first customers. He had Luis to thank, and alas, probably God too, for leaving the side door of the church unlocked. Luis had assumed this dereliction of duty not long after the coffee shop had opened for business, as though to say, if we're going to lure the well-heeled from the avenue with cappuccino and biscotti, then certamente we could accommodate more shadowy passers-by with a dry place to sleep. At first, only one or two men slipped in, vague forms vaguely familiar from the church steps, where they would hunch and rock before burrowing for the night into middens of flattened cardboard, newspaper, bubble pack, and Spurlock could not bear to think what else. Later, when the weather cooled, more faces appeared at the shelter, followed shortly by a citation from the city, mounting complaints from some parishioners, enthusiasm from others, and the long, tedious debates in vestry meetings, the endless declension of earnest phrases, the least of these, the least we can do, doing mission, clarity of mission, mission creep. Holding up the citation, Mrs. Nickerson said, as though for the first time, for this chief, we have our Luis to thank. The visitors were men, most of them older, many of them trembling, all untalkative. God knew how long they had lived on the street or what they had experienced at Bellevue or Ward's Island to drive them from the archipelago of licensed city shelters. The parish might have been more welcoming had they been battered women or gay teens expelled from suburban homes, but these shuffling mutterers shrank from all expression of sympathy or concern. To each one, sealed in his grease cake garments and encasing stench, the merest acknowledgement seemed unbearable. For Father Spurlock, the stench was the hardest part. At some point in a gesture of what he described as solidarity, he'd begun sleeping four nights a week on a cot alongside them. He would doze briefly, overcome by the exhaustion of the day, only to wake when the smell reached him, an infiltrating mist, the sublimation of ash and tooth rot, urine and scurf. In time, he thought at first, he might learn to give himself over to it, even to welcome it as a cleansing penance. Solidarity with the poor, the naked, the captive. Oh, cinder path of saintly effacements, the nobility of it, the absurdity of it. 
A bubble of his drowned divinity school idealism rose up in his throat, then dissipated like a sighing belch. How quickly it had happened, his transformation from freshly ordained provisional deacon, scrubbed and penny bright, ablaze for avant-garde liturgies and boisterous youth programs into a nail-biting, sheep-counting, budget-hobbled rector yoked to a listless parish, or rather, the remnant of one. His predecessor, Mother Janice, had departed to serve uptown as canon of the cathedral, along with her ringing laugh, her famous saxophone, and the younger half of the congregation. The senior warden still insisted on calling him Sonny the Kid in vestry meetings. He'd been, in fact, the youngest rector installed in the nearly 200-year history of the church, but whatever remained of that youthfulness now seemed to hang from him like a dinner jacket surprised by a Sunday sunrise. The turmoil of five brief years had disgorged him onto a midlife plateau, where somewhere in the distance his wife Bethany labored grimly to make partner at her law firm, because, as she put it, someone had to earn an actual living in this marriage. Singled out among the squadron of lawyers marshaled to defend a pharmaceutical corporation in a class action case, Bethany had been rewarded by her superiors with ever escalating responsibilities, and the hours she spent at work had multiplied accordingly. When she'd first been assigned to the case, he'd announced with some satisfaction that he would see to it that dinner was waiting for her when she got home, whenever she got home. But this resolution had collapsed in the boneyard of his other ma marital initiatives, learning bridge, couples yoga. It was more convenient for Bethany to eat with her team before it renewed its evening onslaught. And anyway, by the time Bethany's heels finally clacked out of the elevator, Spurlock would have long since fallen asleep on the sofa, pinned beneath the puttering bulk of Perpetua, his cat. Without consulting his wife or even himself, Spurlock had doubled, then redoubled his initial one night a week commitment to the impromptu shelter in the church. Had he perversely come to perverse, prefer sleeping in the church, he asked himself, steeped in odors of sweat and destitution. Was this how the Holy Spirit bent the soul to virtue, not by persuasion, but simply by revoking alternatives? But no, he knew he had come to spend more than half his nights in the shelter, not because doing so was virtuous, but because it was plausible. Plausible and easy, a path of minimal resistance, an easy slide from his upstairs office, past Mrs. Nickerson's desk, down the stairwell and into the church. If the church was a ship, and that's what knave meant, he explained each year to his handful of bored confirmands, then an impervious gravity drew him down into steerage with his, the skeleton crew, these ghostly stowaways. At this, as this path hollowed its groove, he had accustomed himself to repeating that everything would be different once the pharmaceutical case was completed, or at least once Bethany had made partner. If, however, that assertion had reassured him in the past, now it carried with it a whiff of dread. In the event, it was the girl who spoke first. Does Padre mean you are the... She paused and cleared her throat, as though unused to the sound of her own voice. The head person? Until then, her face and profile projected a severity sharpened by the high bridge of her nose, by the ink stroke of her eyebrow. Now that she had turned toward him, however, her face seemed younger, her lips full and pursed around an uncertainty. In his confusion at finding himself the object of that gaze, he registered somewhere in it the glint of gold, a rivet or staple piercing her septum or eyebrow, or was it the hood of her ear? Less an adornment, he thought, than a mortification of the flesh. He thought, how intolerable it is to the young, their beauty. Head person, I like the sound of that, he said, putting on affability. She did not smile in return, so he said, yes, I am the rector here, Nelson Spurlock. How can I help you? He would never forget what she said then. I believe you might have something for, for a Clementine Abend, something my father sent you. Her father? Whose daughter was this? Had she mistaken him for someone? Had he met her somewhere and forgotten? But that, he knew abruptly, was an impossibility, impossible that such a face, that he could ever have forgotten it. 
I'm sorry, he said, your, your father, he sent you something. A letter maybe, I don't, I don't know exactly, maybe some papers. Your father is a parishioner? No, uh, he was a psychoanalyst, but I believe that a patient of his, I believe you performed the funeral for a patient of his, a person named Jessica Burke. Jessica Burke, of course he remembered. Hers had been the first funeral he had conducted after his installation as rector. 28 years old, Jessica Burke had been when she died of an overdose, not much younger than Spurlock himself was at the time. He had never met her, but the sacristan had placed a photograph on a little easel by the coffin, a portrait that Jessica Burke, a struggling artist, had made of himself in a mirror, standing behind an expensive box camera, a Hasselblad or Roliflex, her face downturned toward the viewfinder, one thin arm, heavily tattooed, crooked behind her head to keep her hair from falling down over her face. The picture had given the impression that Jessica Burke had showed up to serve as photographer at her own funeral, underdressed, uninvolved, annoyed to have to work on a Saturday morning. Your father knew me only because I buried a patient of his. The girl had spread a handwritten sheet of paper on the counter between them. He says here, she began, but interrupted herself. This document, she began again, it's a testament, a, a will, or at least a piece of one. Your father's will? Yes, it's in French. I can translate if you like. He said something about having studied a little French in high school, but she had already begun. Maître, it begins, she said, following the line of precise cursive with her finger. Master, Spurlock, Spurlock ventured. Yes, she said with a flush of what might have been impatience, but that's just how you address a lawyer or a jurist. Maître, it begins, she said, then recommenced her fluent rendering of the French, pausing now and again, waiting for a satisfactory English expression to present itself. The legal phrases coming obediently to her, he thought afterward, as they might to one already well acquainted with the wishes of the dead. I, the undersigned, she read, currently residing at 152 West 79th Street, apartment A, New York, New York, do hereby declare this to be the codicil to my last will and testament. As the habitation, no, that, uh, that's wrong, she said, not habitation, dwelling, maybe, domicile. As the domicile I shared with my daughter throughout the period of her minority shall forthwith be vacated and sold. I do hereby authorize and direct that following, she paused again, that, that pursuant to the settling of my estate, all future correspondence concerning said estate be forwarded to my one child and only inheritor. No, not, not inheritor, heir. Sole heir is better. To my sole heir at the following address. That's this address, she said, turning the sheet toward him so that he could read it himself. Miss Clementine Abend care of the Reverend Nelson Spurlock, rector, the Church of the Incarnation, New York City, New York, USA, which is this church, right? He nodded, but she had already begun to translate the two remaining sentences on the sheet. Except for the limited provision stated herewith, I confirm and republish my last will and testament, duly witnessed and signed 15 August 2008 on file at the law offices of Krulwich, Labrie, and Steiner. I pray you to accept, Master, my most respectful salutations, 29 August, 2008. That's the end of it, she said. He didn't even sign it. I am Nelson Spurlock, Spurlock heard himself say, unnerved to see his name on a page written hardly two weeks ago snared in a stranger's handwriting in a language he could not read. So anything that would have been sent would have been sent to you. Is that what it says, said Spurlock? You haven't received anything? Received, he repeated, as though that word too were in another language? In the mail, like it says, any time in the past month or so. No, although no, perhaps my secretary, Spurlock stammered, as though any piece of mail would could possibly arrive without Mrs. Nickerson opening it immediately. No, he said finally, I haven't seen anything. No letter, no package, nothing, he said, surprised by how it pained him to say so. But why should it hurt him to disappoint her, this stranger little more than half his age? <laughs>
I'm sorry, Miss Abend, he said, but if you could write down your own address and your phone number too, I promise I'll let you know if something appears, when something appears, right away. It was then, at that precise instant, that something in her countenance changed. Suddenly she was looking at him as though he were the one speaking an incomprehensible language. I give you my word, he said, if the address on the will, Clem uh, Miss Abend, if the address written there, the one on the Upper West Side, is no longer good, he blundered on. Is there a better one where I can reach you? What? If this address, if another one is better, one way or another, Miss Abend, I promise you, Spurlock said, forcing back the certainty that he was speaking to himself only. Clementine Abend, she said, but broke off. Yes, Clementine, if I could, he said, unnerved by the insistence in his own voice, all I would need, he'd taken a pen from his pocket and realizing he had no paper, began to write her name on the palm of his hand. Clementine Abend, he said, pronouncing the name slowly as he wrote it out. But after muttering something about having to go, the girl had retreated from the counter toward her table under the Noah window, and in what seemed like a single swift movement, had shouldered her bag and passed out onto the street. The gimlet eye of the stained glass crow met Spurlock's. What now, father? The crow seemed to ask. That had been three weeks ago. For days afterwards, he would find himself wondering if Clementine Abend would appear again to inquire once more if anything had been sent to her, to his care. In his care, Spurlock thought. Abend, thought Spurlock. The name had meant nothing to him. He had consulted the parish records and had found no one by the name of Abend. He had even flipped through the parish visitor's book to the day of Jessica Burke's funeral three years earlier. Abend, Abend, but again, nothing. And he was confident in his memory for names and faces, whether of parishioners or visitors. If something did arrive, how would he find her? She had left nothing behind. He would simply have to continue to wait for her to appear again, though there had been no sign of her. The disquiet he felt, did it stem from the sight of his name caught in the indecipherable toil of a stranger's writing? Or was its origin as he began to suspect something quite different? the thought that he would not see that face, her face, ever again. Three uneasy weeks passed. She had not appeared. Nothing had arrived. Nothing. Until today. Spurlock blinked, willing himself awake. If this was sleep, he wanted none of it, this awful weight bearing down on him, cold and rigid, measuring its length to his. If he could just dislodge it, if he could just rise from his cot, he could prove that the weight was not a weight. He could grope his way up to the church office, to his desk, where he would see that the package resting on it was still only a package, still was what it had been before he had, thinking of something else, torn open the seal. It was just another piece of the day's mail, just another envelope on his desk, a package like any other sent by accountants, tax attorneys, auditors, the diocesan offices, packages Mrs. Nickerson would date stamp and shunt the appropriate file or vestry committee. So what if this envelope, a slick striated paper stamped with foreign postage, proved unshuntable, marked as it was personal and confidential in painstaking block capitals? Were he to open it again, he would see that the envelope contained just a stack of pages, each one a weightless sheet of onion skin. Maybe he would discover that he had not, in fact, read them through in a single paralyzed sitting, that they, too, were the tatters of a dream he'd shaken off and discarded. Maybe he would find himself once more a stranger to the voice that those pages relayed, wrapped, patient, heated, and tempered insistent as the bit of a rock drill drilling a rock face. Father, you will not remember me. My name is Daniel Abend. A cry jerked into his senses. Had it been his or a cry from one of the sleepers? He tried to fasten his gaze to something, anything, in the darkness swirling above him, but he found no purchase in it, in the particular total blackness of stained glass at night, the panes lightless now as the webs of lead they'd been set in, every figure as black now as Noah's crow. He could hear, beyond the breath and rustle of the sleepers, the restless avenue, 
After all, the night could not be so far gone, but the black of the windows insisted that the church, like a cavern or coal gallery, had no exterior. I believe you may have something, something my father sent you, she had said, her face no longer the severe etched profile, but facing him as she spoke as it faced him now, a perfect oval, the eyes a flat, bright nickel gray, with somewhere the glint of gold piercing her because, Spurlock thought, the beauty of the young was intolerable to them. Something for a Clementine Abend. No, it was obvious she was no longer a girl, however clear the gray of her eye, however smooth the curve of her cheek. Something or someone had drawn down over that face an invisible perpetual veil of care. I believe you have something, something my father sent you. He'd had nothing for her when she came three weeks ago, but then in this morning's mail it had arrived, the heavy env envelope containing that stack of weightless pages. You will not remember me. My name is Daniel Abed. He had read it, bent over his desk, oblivious of Mrs. Nickerson's departure, of the window's failing light at his back, the world itself falling away, and with it the substance of his own body. Spurlock, a mere shadow, bent over the stack of lamplit pages, each sheet weightless but tight peened with type, as though the words themselves had invested the stack with its intractable mass, the mass that now bore down upon him. She had not returned. A certainty, at once unwarranted and undeniable, filled him. He would never see Clementine Abend again. So sleep at last dismantled the troubled spirit of Father Spurlock. But even as that darkness without exterior closed around him, he felt the blackness shiver and crack, a network of fissures feathered out in a blizzard of fragments, flocked up and on the wing, a cloud of agitations collecting its formlessness to a shape at first spheroid and revolving, then conic, vortical, funneling itself into his chest as when in autumn at nightfall, a blackout of blackbirds drains into a single tree. And so it begins. Thank you, DeSales. Uh, it was terrific. Um, I guess, uh, you know, we didn't, um, that's, that's the beginning. I wanted to, uh, to just ask you about the, um, about the, you know, not only do you teach poetry, but poetry features really prominently in the novel, um, particularly the, the Yeats poem, uh, The Stolen Child. So what was your, um, can you talk a little bit about that poem and, you know, what drew you to incorporate it? Yeah. So it's a, it's an early Yeats poem, which is to say it comes from a period in that poet's life, um, which was fascinated with the, the phantasmical phantasmagorical world, I guess, of fairyland, of a kind of alternative or mirror world outside of this world, which is, as he puts it in that poem, um, too full of grief and suffering for us to grasp and, and understand. And that, that poem called The Stolen Child is, is a, 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 a beckoning poem. It's a poem that calls to this uh, unnamed or unspecified person uh, to come with the speakers, the speakers who are fairies, um, into this other world. And that transition will require the sacrifice of one's own mortal life. One has to sort of give up our attachments to the world. Um, and that will be a great loss, but it will also effect a rescue. So the, the person who to whom that poem is addressed has to make a choice. And that, that choice is to stay in the world with all of its weeping and all of its suffering or move over into a world where the rules are different, things are ritualized, things are formalized. A principle of pure beauty or pure pleasure governs all transactions but that in such a world, one is, is simply no longer human. And the, the brilliance of, of the poem in, in my mind or to my ear is the way that the poem consists only in that, in that invitation. The 
the hearer, or the child does in fact make the transition, but we as the readers, the human readers, are really left wondering about our own attachments to the human world, the world of weeping and suffering, and all of those other alternative worlds toward which we long. For Nelson Spurlock, one of those worlds would be the, the world of, of a religious regulation of experience, the way in which all of our sufferings can be bound up into a narrative of sacrifice and redemption. For a psychoanalyst, perhaps, all of our longing can be gathered together into a full human expression of the difficulties and torments of life, but that the very expression of those difficulties and torments would confer upon life a kind of depth and meaning. But each of those transactions requires a great sacrifice. So Yeats, in talking about the, the transition to fairyland, is talking about a kind of sacrifice that is discussed elsewhere by many of Yeats's psychoanalytically, psychoanalytically informed contemporaries. His dates are almost identical to those of Freud's um, on the one hand. And then the much older, much more ancient, complex, globally diffuse narratives of, of religious redemption or, or regulation of, of human suffering. That's the, that's the role that, that, that the idea occupies in the middle of the book. But, but in some other way, the, the poem functions in this purely uh, menacingly mechanical way also. Because what, what happens as the, the Daniel Abend character uh, goes about his life, his comfortable bourgeois life as a psychoanalyst in New York City in the, in the early 2000s, he begins to receive mail in a post office box um, that he keeps for receiving his bills from his patients, as many analysts do, to keep their home address um, out of the equation, the analytic equation. He starts receiving copies of this poem. The only difference between each instance is that the poem has had more of its length. It's not too long, but it's several stanzas. More of its length torn away. So the, the poem, as it arrives over and over again through the course of the book, is shortening, is, is bearing down on its own conclusion in which the stolen child actually vanishes. That idea of, of poetry as being about a, the winding down of a clock is a is a profound idea, formal idea that goes probably all the way back to the roots of the the lyric tradition in the West. Certainly, it's explicitly everywhere in in Shakespeare's sonnets. To take a completely conspicuous classical example, um, and so in, in encountering this poem in his mailbox, Daniel Abend is encountering something that you know it's a kind of concrete or mechanized version of, of what we encounter every day, namely the knowledge that our time is running out, that the, the time that we have to make things right, if there are things we need to make things right, is shortening up, and that we have to make a choice about our current human attachments and possibly stepping over into another world in which a better way or a different way of existing is purchased at the cost of some of that, that human life, whether our own through gestures of self-sacrifice or more troubling through the sacrifice of other people. And, and this is ultimately, for me, this is a book about, about what it means to, to sacrifice other people um, and that the, the crimes such as they are, the crime at the center of the book um, has to do with the question of whether or not it's okay for us to even for the best of, of intentions to, to sacrifice in whatever form that, that takes in the book to sacrifice other people to our own purposes and ends. Um, so that's the kind of confected uh, rigged quality of the book. Like it's, you know, it's governed, the, the, the story is governed by the intelligence of the person who is sending these, these letters to Daniel Abend. That person wants an accounting of something that Daniel Abend did in the past that he would just as soon forget. And um, the story is simply the story of how that accounting gets made. Uh, and for me, the, the one of the, the lovely things about just about poetry is that it, it is a way of confronting 
not entirely unlike the way in which we confront our, our aging countenance in the mirror every morning before brushing our teeth or shaving or whatever. Um, that, that poetry is constantly reminding us that it, 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 through its very shortness, that, that formal commitment to shortness, often the commitment to being shorter than a single page is a commitment to, to thinking about mortality. The fact that things have to sort themselves out in an ever diminishing space or time. And then there is also, there's a second poem. So, um, so Nelson Spurlock is a priest and I assume that means he's an Episcopal priest. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. He's an Episcopal priest. And at, at another point, there's a, a poem, uh, Love Three by George Herbert. George Herbert was an Anglican priest, I think, which was yeah. the, the ancestor of the, the, the American yeah. Episcopal tradition. And um, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about that poem? Sure. And, I mean, is, does yeah. that come in a similar way or is that? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a kind of counter example in the, in the book. Um, the poem Love Three by, by George Herbert is in no superficial way related to the Yeats at all. Although it's interestingly phantasmagorical or hallucinatory and weird in its in its own right, um, but they're remarkably similar in that they're both about unwillingness. Um, in Love Three, the the speaker is just the first person speaker, the kind of anonymous, tormented, um, but bright and resourceful, humorous soul that is always in some kind of conflict or negotiation with God. Uh, and in, in that poem, the speaker professes to a kind of virtuousness and saying that love, God as love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back gu guilty of dust and sin. And we immediately have a kind of Herbert style confrontation between the divine, which is wanting the human person to do something, and a, the, a principle of resistance in that human person, like the, the heels dig in, the brakes go on, and the human person here, the speaker, the I, begins in this wonderfully charming, um, and I think deeply recognizable way, begins by thinking all kinds of resistances to this in invitation. So whereas for Yeats, the beckoning occurs, it's, it's delivered to a child and the child really doesn't have the powers of mind. The, the, the child is purely influenceable and can be guided and turned into a changeling and abducted by fairies. But Herbert, the, the soul is always adult. Um, the soul is always educated and reasonable. Um, it, the, the soul kind of knows what it wants or thinks that it does. Um, it's always wrong about that, but it, but it perceives itself to know what it wants. And the love in bidding the soul welcome is, is met with that fundamental resistance. And then through the kind of loving progression of the poem, that existence, that resistance, excuse me, is, is overridden. Um, and whereas the speaker thinks of it as first off being a battle of wits, um, where sort of testing his wits against the wits of God, never a very good idea, um, always a seductive possibility for, for Herbert speakers, um, goes sort of toe to toe with God and finds himself kind of just like tumbled over in the end. But in this really unsurprised, I mean, in this really kind of astonishing, surprising, unexpected way at the end, um, where, where God in effect says that, that in this, ultimately utterly overpowering assertion of divine prerogative says that, you know, I want you to be my guest because I'm God. Like I, th that this is simply coming from me as divine prerogative. It's not a question of whether or not you feel worthy to sit at my table and eat my food. Um, but because I am God, I made the rational faculties with which you're trying to debate with me. I am going to win this particular dispute. And, and God does win. And it, it ends not with an act of intellectual assent, but it ends with a moment of sitting and sharing a meal. And, and of course, like theologically, we can say that that's a Eucharistic meal and, and what we happen to be eating is the body of God. Um, but it's also in that wonderfully day-to-day -day ordinary kind of Anglican middle of the road way. It's just sitting down together and eating. Um, 
like shutting up and eating. And for that, that kind of human possibility where you get to just sort of sit down and share an experience or a meal or nourish yourself with someone else who may happen to be God, um, but but that doesn't require the destruction of the human person. Mm. That's the that's the other alternative in in the world, and it's an alternative that Daniel Abend never can acknowledge. There's the, there's the protagonist, the psychoanalyst at the center of the book. It remains for other people to see that as a possibility, the possibility that um, making things right in the world, getting things right with other people doesn't involve sacrificing either oneself or that other person. Um, it remains for Nelson, who's not a big thinker, he's not a poet, he's not a theoretician, but it remains for, for Nelson Spurlock to just ultimately be aware of that alternative um, that, that Daniel Abend never in fact realizes or can comprehend. The, the, the place where Daniel for all of his extraordinary sort of resourcefulness and inventiveness and all kind of hallucinatory paranoia, um, the, where he's stuck at, which is, I think, in some way, in my own my own personal belief, um, is that that's where most of us are stuck at, and that is that we can think ourselves out of most of our problems, and that would be, you know, possibly the the promise of psychoanalysis that that the conscious mind can ultimately come to terms with all of the mass of unconscious experience um, that putatively determines our our the shape of our lives. Um, from the point of view of someone like George Herbert, of course, really what we think about things, our, our ingenuity, our capacity to convince ourselves of almost anything is utterly beside the point. We're lovable to God, not because of anything that we can think of, any kind of fancy formulation um, that we can come up with in speech or writing, but ultimately um, to the extent that we are God's own creatures. And I just wanted to, in writing the book, I wanted to sort of T-bone those two ideas into each other. And I, it's a great question about the poems because I think, you know, even though I never thought of it that way, one relies on one's readers to tell one what is going on in a book always, um, was that it's really in those two poems that 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 T-boning probably is most schematically visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I hope I'm not, I may be inarticulate here, but it seemed to me like there's some maybe intimation that, um, at least some of the characters believe that in order to really, you, you know, you may be able to live these concepts of, uh, of, well, yeah, in order to really know uh, God or to know love, uh, you have to sacrifice your life, really, to truly know these things. Um, maybe I'm way off there and what you were hoping for, but that, you know, you seem to be now just, you know, offering an alternative or, you know, the characters offer an alternative that you can live these things, you know, it doesn't mean you know them or that psychoanalysis and these methods of self-revelation will eventually reveal the truth to you. You know, yeah. such a thing does not exist for us. Yeah. Um, can you help me like tie those things together? No, that, that's a lovely way of putting it. I think you know, one of the, 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 what one longs for, and maybe, you know, as a reader of, of fiction, uh, particularly mystery fiction or fiction that's constructed around a certain kind of like explicit question, like who done it, like what what happened here, um, who did this thing? Usually, that thing is a bad thing, and we have judicial concerns that we want to bring to bear, like who's going to get punished for this? Or let's hope it's the right person. That all of that expresses a desire for some kind of epiphany, as you as you put it, Isaac, that we that we would be finally accorded some blazing encounter with like the capital T truth or knowledge and that we can then sort out everything with respect to that that revelation like the butler did it or I did it um, or the you know the white whale or late capitalism or Donald Trump or whatever you know like just that 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 desire to assign responsibility um, as a way for knowing for you know, not only for knowing who done it, who did it, but also the the deeply rooted desire and hope that responsibility can in fact be allocated 
that responsibility is something that exists, it can be distributed appropriately, and we can all agree at the end of the book, at the end of the story, at the end of our lives to where it should go and how it should be, how it should be distributed. Mm -hmm. And as you point out, um, if it ever works out like that, it, it works out in vanishingly tiny um, situations. Um, yes. And that, you know, I think particularly as we, uh, retrospectively, if we try to make sense of, of who we are based on who our primary attachments are, like, and, you know, those, those the primary attachments that we don't choose, namely our biological parents, assuming we know who they are like there's a kind of fundamental opacity to that like why who chose this state of affairs where i the sales harrison and the child of these these two people um who's in some way like i had nothing to do with any of that uh, those coordinates or those determinants of my existence um but that there's an inexhaustible interest or an inexhaustible um frustration probably is a better term an inexhaustible frustration about making sense of that combination you know what does it mean for me that i was born to these people in this particular historical moment in this particular culture all, all of those kind of like basic things and i think that on a on a really elemental level mystery writing or genre fiction in general responds to gratifies those primary curiosities um you know, it's it's you know even now even though the so many of these kind of like basic generic patterns these plot patterns have been repeated over and over and over again from Oedipus to Sherlock Holmes um, to all kinds of Donna Tard current current practitioners Tanya French um, you know really you know, amazingly inventive people but in some way doing the same thing returning over and over again to the uh, to the, the question of, of who done it. The philosopher Jonathan Lear, this is his last sort of thought I have on this, who, who was a professor of mine at Yale, he's now at Chicago. Um, but he, he made the remark that there are actually, there are two Oedipus complexes in Freud or in psychoanalysis in general. And we, we think of there's like the cartoon, New Yorker cartoon version of the Oedipus complex where, uh, one kind of comes to the blinding admission, uh, admission or acknowledgement that one is like sexually attached and drawn to one's mother as to no one else and aggressively drawn to or, or, or in a, a violent or murderous posture toward one's father as toward no one else. Um, and that's kind of appalling and unthinkable, but, but thrilling and, and like that's the epiphany. Now, there's a wonderful moment in the, the the interpretation of dreams where Freud talks about the fact that you know you can tell a patient right away what it is they're, that they're going to discover because we are all structured in the same kind of way, but it's only in arriving at that recognition him or herself that the that the, the epiphany has the value of an epiphany. And Lear says um, that's all fine and good, and in some way a very profound observation about how human beings are set up and what it means to come to some form of of internal understanding. He says it's the second, it's number two Oedipus complex um, that is the one that we just need to be spending more time thinking about. And that's the, the moment in the Oedipus narrative where it, it's set up that, that Oedipus realizes that the culprit that he's looking for is Oedipus. I am the person who did this. And it, you know, the fact that it had to do with sleeping with his mother and murdering his father, all of that's very lurid and thrilling and exciting and everyone gasps and faints or whatever um, when they discover that. But it's, the, it's the, the basic moment of the ascription of responsibility to oneself. Like I am the person who is, is somehow the locus of action or the locus of responsibility. And he puts out his um, eyes, right? Uh... And that, that's when he pulls it, pulls, and yeah. And that, you know, that it's at that moment that he gains a form of second sight. It's a form of ethical sight or a form of moral sight. Um, but that it, in some way it has nothing to do with the more, the, the, the sort of sexed up, conspicuous, bizarre, grotesquerie of murdering one's father and sleeping with, with one's mother and everything to do with uh, that kind of basic transaction that, we, that each one of us is invited to perform every day, which is, you know, I'm, I am the person who's responsible for certain elements of, of my experience or for coming to an understanding of certain elements of my experience. Um, 
Um, and, you know, the, the, so there are always maybe two answers to the question of who done it, but one is, you know, the butler did it, um, or, uh, you know, the king of, of Thebes did it. Um, but there's also the, the other answer, which is the answer proper to the second Oedipus complex, and that's that I did it, you know, that I am somehow implicated in this, I'm involved in this state of affairs that is, um, that is the painful experience of, of human reality. Uh, and, you know, the, what is so, I think uh, there's a kind of grandeur in, in psychoanalysis in the idea that, um, that there's no end to that question, that one, that one can continue to return to the, the question of what my implication here is, what my involvement is, not because I'm so fascinating, um, it, in a way precisely because I'm not so fascinating, because like ultimately the answers are all very similar, you know, we, we tend to want the same things, we just want them in different ways. Uh, the, the, I find the, the inexhaustible uh, richness of, of certain forms of genre fiction, like the, like the mystery novel, are ways of just returning over and over to that question of, of you know, what are the, the, the conditions and, and terms of my own responsibility. It just makes for a different, it's a form of ethical thought that's mediated by art. And we're all very, you know, drawn these days to, to forms of conspicuous uh, ethical thought mediated by political discourse, um, mediated by historical discourse. Uh, everything looks quite different. Uh, and of course, mediated by scientific discourse as well. Everything looks quite different. Those questions all look different when you talk about the ways in which they're mediated by art. Um, and as an English professor, you know, I feel a certain kind of em emphatic, urgent um, need to, to say that art's way of thinking about these issues is every bit as valuable uh, for and unassimilable to these other ways, the historical or social science way of thinking about ethics or the scientific way of thinking about the, the nature of the universe, um, that, that the, the way that, that art implicates those people who consume it or, or admire it or participate in it or make it is always going to feel different, look different, sound different, be different from the forms of certainty that we're all constantly being kind of browbeaten into to accepting in other magisteria of understanding, whether they be scientific or social scientific. And the, the fantastic thing I think about this, this moment is, this historical moment is waiting for because we've all gone through such incredible upheaval with the pandemic and with the, the cataclysmic forms of social unrest that we've all lived through and, and observed, um, is, is waiting to see how art catches up to and makes sense of that. You know, art is in some way the least predisposed to making hot takes. Um, and we're, we're going to be able to see having lived through these extraordinary times, we're going to be able to see those new forms coming into visibility uh, in ways that we never could have anticipated. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. It's a sh hard, super, th it's a challenge to be a novelist in those because, you know, my, the, the novel itself seems like such an outdated form. And, um, you know, it always has, brings about the whiff of antiquity uh, to it as do most standard genres. And it's never a, an open or pre-decided question how it's going to adapt or, or change. That's, there's something I find um, very optimistic about that, that final note, you know, um, there is maybe, you know, the possibility for good art still to be made and, and for it to, uh, you know, comment on, reflect on and inspire our, our everyday lives. Um, I just wanna thank you uh, so much for joining us. Um, our guest, uh, Professor DeSales Harrison, was here to talk about his, uh, his, his debut novel, The Waters in the Wild. Uh, you can pick it up here or you know, uh, online or at your local bookstore. Um, and uh, I just wanna thank uh, Rory Martorana and uh, Seth Godfrey and um, the New Haven, you know, gift givers to the New Haven Free Public Library um, who made this event possible and others like it. And um, we have other great events coming up soon. We're gonna be, uh, um, talking to Ta Ping Chen, uh, who's a Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote a uh, collection of short stories called Land of Big Numbers um, on the 20th. So I'd love to uh, see any and all of you there. Um, and this has been brief, but really enjoyable for me. Um, so I thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you, Isaac, and thank you, New Haven Public Library. It's really been a pleasure and an honor for me to 